Today on No Greater Love with Pastor Jeff Kramer. So he's saying that our union in Christ, it breaks all of this stuff. It breaks us out from being a slave to the law. It breaks us out from the law of sin. It breaks us out from underneath the Mosaic law, the law of conscience, the law of innocence, and all that stuff that we find in the, you know, the beginning sections of the Old Testament. Through the death of Christ, it is through the body of Christ, it is through his death, his burial, his resurrection, it's through what Jesus has done that we have been set free, and his emphasis is trying to use marriage to get that across. Welcome to No Greater Love with Pastor Jeff Kramer. A thermometer can be a useful tool in our lives, can it? We use it daily to see if we need to turn up the heat or turn on the AC. It's a practical analogy for the limitations of the thermometer itself. It has the function of measurement, but cannot alter the temperature. This analogy extends to the discussion of religious laws in Romans chapter 7. In our study today, Paul highlights the purpose of the law, emphasizing its usefulness in revealing the shortcomings in our lives. Despite our best efforts, the law cannot change our inherently sinful nature. Therefore, emphasizing the need for a transformative power beyond the law itself, which is found in faith in Christ. It raises a question, how can we achieve victory and live a life aligned with Christ? Let's dive in with Pastor Jeff in a message titled, Unchain Me. And as we move here into chapter 7, uh, dealing with another aspect of sanctification, not the slavery component is dealing with sin, but but under the component of dealing with law and the you know from the Mosaic law to the law of innocence right at creation uh, to the law of conscience, all of these different things, he puts a different picture here, if you will, of working us through sanctification. Now uh, we know this that as we survey the scriptures, uh, the New Testament primarily. Uh, we know that, that when it comes to sanctification, that, that, that uh, we are under constructions as Christians the entirety of our life, that, that God is doing a work in us and God is doing a work through us. And while it is true that some uh, perhaps make better progress than others, um, the same thing is also true is, is that we are in the grip of grace and God is doing a work within us. It is our call to learn, to grow, to understand what God has said, the promises that he's given, and for us to consciously to obey those problems. Huh, problems? How about promises? <laughs> I don't want to obey the problems. I don't like those. <laughs> Move away problems. And so, again, uh, back in, in Romans 6, um, you know, he gave, that, he gave us our union with Christ, okay? Uh, what was it? it? It was us identifying with his death and with his resurrection, Two super important things, his death and his resurrection. You know, first, as we come to the Lord, we must realize that we are sinners. And we must realize what Christ has done on the cross for us. And so um, while that may sound elementary, there is never a day or a moment or a second within our lives that we ever get around that. It is always through the death and the resurrection of Christ that we are able to come to the Father. It's only through Jesus. And that identification is what he lined up for us in... Um, Chapter 6 there. Uh, and then he, he, he put the capstone on it in verse number 7, 6 and 7. He says, uh, for he who has died has been free from sin. We've been freed from sin. So the result of Christ's death, the result of his resurrection is the fact that we've been freed from sin. Okay, the second thing he goes on down here, Romans 6 and 18. Let me read this to you as well. He says, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Okay, great. Because we were set free, now we're slaves to God, if you will, okay? Not in this heavy, oppressive way, but rather in the way that because we've been set free, we were no longer in that place here to where we're walking under the repressive things in this life, in this culture, in this world that hold us back from following the Lord. The repressive stuff that comes up around us is the, is the enemy of our soul. He loves to keep us in a place to where we're chained, to where we're bound, to where we're struggling over things. And, and what Christ has done, he set us free from all of that, and we're no longer under the, rep the repressive things within this world. Now, if the Bible study was to stop right there, 
I could pick up and give personal testimony in my life. Because, listen, coming to Jesus here, when I came to Jesus, you know, in, in 1993, that, that God brought me into a group of people that were awesome at worshiping him. They were amazing. And they were super awesome at serving him as well. We did all kinds of stuff. I lived in San Diego, Jody and I and our kids. And, and, and we were regularly going across the border down into to TJ and Tecate and, and even farther out into Mexico City and La Paz. We did all stuff all across, um, you know, I guess the Baja Peninsula down there and everything. But, but one thing here that this group didn't do well, and that was is they didn't understand the doctrines of the Bible very well. They didn't understand the aspect of what God's word has to say. And, and because of that, I could jump real high and get super excited about serving God and all that stuff. But I tell you, when I was away from the crowd and I was back at my house, that some of the areas that I crashed in were, were just like no-brainer places, places that I should have known as an early Christian, okay? And so what Paul is doing here is he's writing ahead, right? He's writing to those that are in Rome. He's writing to the new Christians that are in Rome, to those people that had just come from Pentecost, uh, or excuse me, from Passover and Pentecost. They had just, you know, left Jerusalem and they had been celebrating the feast. But now he gives them good, solid Christian doctrine. And uh, listen, if you have a, uh, if you got something to strike a note on, uh, take this note down. Uh, and, and maybe if you've got a summary page there at the beginning of uh, the Book of Romans, maybe you could write this down, and it will help you give the overview of Romans. Okay. Um, this is not going to be exhaustive. It's just going to be uh, hopefully a snapshot here. But in the first eight chapters of Romans, this is, this is the breakdown. Super simple. First eight chapters, okay? It, these are the, this is the portion of Romans that is dealing with doctrine. And, and the first thing that Paul gets into is he gets into dealing with the aspect of sin. He deals with the secular man. He deals with the moral man. He deals with the religious man. He, he, he deals with all of these things, and he lines everything up under, under the fact that everybody is guilty before God, hands down, no exception. So the doctrine of sin. Secondly, as he moves to the second half of chapter 3 all the way through chapter 5, he begins to speak about salvation, okay? This is that work of justification, that work that Christ has done for us, uh, the pronouncement of the Father, hey, we're justified because of Jesus. So the doctrine of sin starts it. He moves into the doctrine of salvation, again, which is getting into justification. And then thirdly, where we're at right now, chapter 6 through chapter 8, this is dealing with the sanctification side. This is the side where we learn how to walk in the newness of life. We learn how to walk as Christians. And when I became, again, when I got saved, when God saved me, I was with a group that loved Jesus, that worshiped him, that served him. It was amazing. It was awesome. But they didn't understand or they didn't emphasize um, some of these areas about sanctification and what I needed to understand as a new believer to keep my feet grounded in Christ. And thus, some of my early days were wobbly. Listen, if you mouth off to me, I'll punch you square in the mouth as, a, as you know, five years into being a believer. Now, for those of you that are older or for those of you that are visiting and don't quite know who I am, uh, I am that squirrely. I'm that crazy in my, you know, 27 years ago and, uh, you know, before I came to, to Jesus, I, I, I had problems, man. But God saved me from those problems. And, and, and in that, 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 those foundational years where I'm supposed to be working out um, you know, sanctification and learning the doctrines of Christ and growing, I was stunted because I didn't understand that. I didn't know. Nobody was teaching me this stuff. And thus, when some rage started popping up in me, um, man, I would, I, would, I would do the things that are unbecoming of a Christian. I would either mouth you or punch you, one of the two. And that's not an exa exaggeration. I was stupid. Surprisingly, I didn't spend more time in jail, though, so maybe that was a work of God's grace or what. I'm not sure what to say. My poor wife's up here going, okay, move on, husband. Okay. Ah. But, but living in a right relationship with Christ, okay, and th this is what we're continuing on. And so when I, when I use the, the phrase here, the biblical phrase, when I use the description of this about sanctification, please, folks, don't tune out and think, well, pastor's going all seminary scholarly stuff on me. N no, I'm not. I'm not a scholarly guy. I, I, I'm just a guy that loves Jesus. I'm a guy that studies the scriptures. I'm a guy that's, that follows the Lord and all of that stuff. And, and this aspect of sanctification is super important for us to make progress. Now, I have talked to a number of you guys on the side. I know a number of you. 
And, and, and I know some of your backstories. I know that some of you have come out of movements and have been in churches where they, you've experienced the exact same thing. Yes. That they've wound you up and they've sent you out and you jump real high, but the second you get back home, your walk is from guardrail to guardrail at best. You know, and, and, and you're just as squirrely. And so my point is, is don't tune out on these things that Paul has given. The, the first part of sanctification in chapter 6, man, we're, we're, we're free from that slavery under sin. We're free from the law of sin. God has worked that out. Doesn't mean that we're not going to struggle with sin. It means he set us free from sin. It means we no longer have to obey sin. It means that God has done something and given us something we don't deserve. As he springs here into chapter 7, we come to our very first point, and that is joined to Christ. Now, I'm not going to reread the first three verses, but I will tell you this, that in these first three verses, he is picking up on the conversation at the end of chapter 6. He says in, in 6 and 22, he says, listen, you've been set free from sin, okay? Great. Now you're slaves of God, and, and here, here's what he says. He says that, that our fruit is to be fruit of holiness. It's to be towards the everlasting uh, life. It, it is not to continue in the practices and the patterns of what God has saved us from. We must understand that we are something new. And now he drops down chapter 7, verse number 1, and, and, and as he says, do you not know, brethren? He is speaking to Jews, Jews that are up in Rome. And, and as he shares this with them, he says that the law has no domin dominion over man. The law has no control over man. Okay, it's, it's not there. Uh, let me rephrase that. I'm speaking about being under Christ. Uh, the, uh, he's pointing back to the law, the Mosaic law. He's, he's speaking back to the, uh, the law of conscience. He's speaking back to uh, the law of innocence. All of these things from earlier on in the Old Testament. He said, as long as a man is alive, that law has dominion. That law has control over a man as long as he lives, okay? Now watch. Verse 2, verse 3, he moves into this illustration. So, so make the transition here. We've been set free in Christ from these laws. He's laying this down to new Christians. The new Christians were Jews, and their tendency was to go back to the Mosaic law. Their tendency was to go back to the oral law. Their tendency was to, to, to be in a place of struggle of dealing with the law of conscience, the law of innocence. Um, that, that was their struggle, okay? So, so he's, he's, he's acknowledging that, but he's, he's trying to put the emphasis here of like, it's like, okay, that's where you were. Let me illustrate how you were dead to that. And, and now we're back in verse two and three, okay? The illustration that he gives is, is in regards to a marriage. Okay, at this particular time when, when Paul lived, when Paul was writing, that a woman didn't have a right to divorce a man. There was no right that was there, that, that under certain conditions, a man could divorce a woman, but a woman couldn't do that to a man. The only way that that was separated, and the illustration he gives right here is, is through death. He says for the, verse two, he says, for the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she's released from that law. She's released from her husband. Verse three, he says, uh, so then... If while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, again, second emphasis, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. So the illustration that he's given, he's speaking to the Jews, he's speaking their language, they got it, they understood it. He, he's using uh, marriage, yes, he's using how those marriage vows, the marriage covenant is broken if the husband dies, the woman is set free, right? Okay, and, and, and man, this is amazing, I guess, how he brings this up because, again, women were second-class citizens in his society. They didn't have any rights. And now he moves into verse number four, and here at verse number four, he gives us that great big old, you know, therefore. So, so he's putting it all together. He's bringing the application to this stuff. He says, therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. So he's saying that our union in Christ, it breaks all of this stuff. It breaks us out from being a slave to the law. It breaks us out from the law of sin. It breaks us out from underneath the Mosaic law, the law of conscience, the law of innocence, and all that stuff that we find in the, you know, the beginning sections of the Old Testament. 
through the death of Christ. It is through the body of Christ. It is through his death, his burial, his resurrection. It's through what Jesus has done that we have been set free. And his emphasis is trying to use marriage to get that across. Now, I hope that's clear and not super muddy, okay? But that's what he's trying to do. And the way that they would interpret law is this way. And the way that, that you and I, perhaps at times we can fall into these places that where we slip into relating to the Lord by way of law. And that is, is that we think that our standing before God is based off of performance. That's how we quickly move back underneath the aspect of the law. That's how we quickly step out from underneath of grace. It, it, is that it's like, man, I just can't get it right on the inside. It, 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 it's like I, I go to this place and I, and I just struggle. It's like, okay, wait a minute. I'm doing all these things. And, and, and one of the ways that we love to release the pressure within our life and, and that struggle that, that many times Satan likes to chain us and bind us in is by doing more. And, and what Paul is teaching in the aspect of sanctification, in the aspect of this lifelong learning process, is that he's trying to teach that we are no longer stuck in sin to have no choice. Christ has set us free through his death. The laws that surround the way that we relate to God are performance. We're not performing to gain God's good graces. He says all that stuff is out of the way. All that stuff is off the table. It is no longer there, and it no longer should be in the aspect of our, of our, of our relationship of enjoying God. What's the takeaway? What's the takeaway for you and I? Listen, as I grow in sanctification, I, I come to that place to where I realize that my efforts to try to earn God's love, his affection, they've got to stop. It's got to stop because that's not healthy. That's, that's not New Testament living. And we have to intentionally and consciously move to the place to where I know the word of God, I know the promises of God, and I can begin to enjoy my relationship with God. That's it. God wants us to enjoy that relationship. He wants it to be a love relationship, not a work harder relationship, okay? Now, under this picture of marriage, he says that we're married to another. Now, I, 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 I'm going to see if I can shape this up here. But as it comes to marriage, do you marry somebody that you hate? Hopefully not, okay? <laughs> Perhaps... Some have, I don't know. <laughs> but hopefully we don't marry somebody that we hate. God gave me a good one. He set one up for me. So Miss Jody is uh, July. We celebrate 34 years, as young as we are, young pups here, still 20 years old. 34 years, man. So he gave me a good one. Now, I will tell you, from my heart to her heart, and may God keep this as the, um, you know, as, as the intention of our hearts all the days of our life, is that there's an aspect of loyalty that is there. There's an aspect of enjoyment that is there. Even through all the painful difficulties of wrestling. We ain't perfect people, and we're, uh, if you don't know this about us yet, we are highly competitive. Sometimes we're highly competitive against each other. <laughs> I don't know if that's good, but hey, Rubin's racing in Missouri, so, <laughs> you know, sparks fly, okay? So don't, don't get the wrong impression here. But the impression that, that, that he wants us to have, the takeaway that he wants us to have is, is that we understand that as we've died to the law, that, that, that this new marriage, this new covenant, this, this new relationship, that our loyalties should switch from this external observance to an internal rest. There's a huge difference between, you know, hey, under the Old Testament, it was an if then. If you do this, then I will do that, God says. If you do this, then God will do that. That's the Old Testament way. You know, that's how they related to God. They had to bring the sacrifice. They had to do all of these external things. Yes, he was after the heart the whole time. Of course. Of course. But what Paul is magnifying is, is what has been given unto us and what he's laying out to these new believers up in Rome is good doctrine. And the good doctrine was to give them a foundation to run upon. It was a foundation that was drawing them away from the works performance. If I do this for God, then I'm accepted and all that stuff to a place to where by faith, they accepted the love of God, the grace of God. They rested in that. And it was from that rest. It was from that new loyalty that they enjoyed the relationship with Christ. Now, if, if, if that was walked out within the church, be it this fellowship or the churches across the land, I got to tell you that attendance would blow through the stinking roof. 
as opposed to a spotty aspect of, hey, I'm coming in one time six, you know, one in six. That's the average in our culture. People show up one week out of six. Listen, what Paul wants us to have is, is that affinity and that he, he wants us to realize that is when we get together on a Sunday morning, we're here assembling for the purposes of God and our loyalty lies with Jesus and everything else that comes into our life, we put it in second best. Now, I'm going to get radical with you guys for just a second because this is my life and right now God has me here as a pastor so I have a little liberty to share with you my life, okay? All through the choruses of Jody and I raising kids and uh, we were married before we came to Christ Okay, um, but all through those years, once, once God set us free from our sin, we didn't get it right, we weren't perfect, we still aren't, but one thing was for certain, and I don't know how this got there, but within our heart, we knew without a shadow of a doubt that I don't care what it was, job-related, career, anything, that we're going to church on Sunday. We're going to church because that is the place that I get to worship Jesus, learn about Jesus, serve Jesus, honor the Lord with our finances. We knew that all the blessings that we had come from God. Paul's using marriage here. One husband has died. That sucker's dead. He's in the grave. Kick him, okay? That, it's over. <laughs> Girls are going, yeah, I'm going to kick that guy. <laughs> now you're a new husband, if, if that's the right word, okay? You know, now you're a new husband. You, you have been set free, and your loyalties are to lie in that new marriage, in that new covenant. That's where the loyalties are. Did you get that word? I keep dropping it. Loyalty, 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 loyalty. That's where your loyalty lies. And it's the, your loyalty is not lying there for the aspect of performance. Oh, Pastor Stan, I got to come to church every Sunday now. Well, where was Pastor last week? He's running a triathlon. It was awesome. So, <laughs> actually, she was. So, please understand. God's not trying to put us back underneath of a law, but he wants the affections, the affinity, the faithfulness, the loyalty of our heart. And he wants us to realize, Paul wants us to realize that, that man, there's a transition from who we were to who we are to be. And there it is. He uses this picture of, of marriage. Now, verse number five, it says this. It says, uh, for when we were in the flesh, the, the sinful passions, uh, which were aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. Now, the sinful passions. Listen, before we I identify with Jesus, listen, our sinful nature was, a, it was aroused by the law to do wrong things. And when we got to that place of the do's and the don'ts, you know, what, what, what happened? <laughs> okay, don't do this. Well, immediately, you do it. It's like raising kids, okay? All right, little Johnny, don't do this. And the next thing you turn around, little Johnny's doing exactly what you told him not to do, okay? And this is what Paul's saying here. Listen, before you knew Christ, this is what happened. This is how these, these things would, they would excite the passions of the flesh. Let me put it to you this way, okay? I think we can all relate to this. If you've watched the news one time in the past 10 years, you probably could relate to this, okay? When our government puts in place, so there's the blowing through the lands of, we're going to restrict guns. What's the first thing that happens? Smith & Wesson gets rich, okay? They have their best year on record. Because you tell people that you're going to do this and take that away and all these particular things, and I'm not making a political joke here, but I am stating reality. And the reality of it is, is that when you tell people they can't do X, Y, and Z, the next thing you know, people are doing X, Y, and Z. So that's why gun sales go up during those seasons. And so I hope it's understandable in terms of what, what he's saying here, okay? He's saying, listen, when you were in the flesh, the sinful passions, they, they are aroused by the law. We're no longer under the law. Or we've died to the law. We, we've identified that in Jesus Christ. And so those things shouldn't be there. The, the sanctification in which we have been given in Christ, it, it, it's not learning about do's and don'ts. It's learning about knowing him so that you won't. There's a huge difference. It's not learning the do's and the don'ts. We're learning about him so that you won't. So your loyalties and your affections lie with Christ, like a marriage. A good one, where you like each other, okay? He showed his love to us. That's all for today. Join us for our next broadcast of No Greater Love with Pastor Jeff Kramer, weekdays at 10.30 a.m. No Greater Love is an outreach ministry of Westminster Calvary and is supported by listeners like you. If you would like to partner with us, please text any dollar amount to 84321. 
we would like to personally invite you to join us for our weekly worship services Sundays at 8 or 10 a.m. and Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. We are located in Westminster, Colorado on the northeast corner of Church Ranch and Wadsworth Parkway near the Vasa Fitness. If you're not local, tune into the weekly live stream on our web campus, app, Roku, or on Apple TV. Have you downloaded the free Westminster Calvary app yet? You can stay up to date on coming events, join a small group, request prayer, and watch live worship services. Just search Westminster Calvary on your favorite app store today. Lastly, we're a church that's ready to serve you. If we can do so, give us a call at 303-223-4640. And remember, there's no greater love than when Jesus gave up his life for you and me. Thanks and God bless.